um, about a third, maybe quarter. No, okay. So, um, so we have people who haven't aren't going to get too much repetition. Then that's good. Um, I'm just going to get started. Quickly, quick overview of the day, who I am, where I'm coming from, uh, what the agenda is, and then I'd like to take questions. Um, uh, I'll just make a nice long list, hopefully, in the side of the board, and we'll make sure we address them. Um, the more questions you have, the more um, things you can bring up that are pertinent to you, uh, hopefully the more valuable the course will be. So, um, there'll be plenty of opportunities for questions as well. But I'll, I'll just get started. My name is Dan Kittredge. Um, most of you probably guessed that by now. Um, I uh, like to say I'll be your entertainment for the weekend, hopefully. Um, may even provide some valuable information. Um, that was a joke, thank you. Someone laughed here. Everybody needs to have their coffee. <laughs> um, I'm from Massachusetts, um, which I guess should give you all pause, or maybe not. Um, <coughs> I, Taxachusetts. It used to be Taxachusetts. And the woman who just who was responsible for changing that just died on Friday um, for making it much more libertarian, actually, in our, in our, in our taxing policy. But in the 70s and 80s, it was definitely Taxachusetts. Um, I grew up on an organic farm uh, in central Massachusetts. Um, it's, you know, the countryside is a little bit hillier than this, but it's, you know, sort of hilly Appalachia. So not, not, a, not a hell of a lot different as far as lay of the land is concerned. Um, my parents bought a 30-acre piece of land, um, about 10 acres of open and 20 acres of rocks and woods, um, built a house. Uh, you know, um, started a homestead. Really, uh, we had uh, we were, and then and then ended up buying another 25 acres across the street. So we had a 55 acre uh, mixed mixed farm. We did uh, about three acres of mixed vegetables uh, pasture for uh, milk cows, uh, beef, um, sheep, um, lots of turkeys and chickens and pigs. Uh, orchard, uh, mixed mixed operation. Uh, we were certified organic in '86. Um, mm -hmm. Farmers markets and um, CSAs. Uh, um, um, I like to say my parents uh, weren't good enough farmers to make a living farming, and so I had to have a day job, uh, like many farmers do. Um, their day job was uh, running, and it still is running, an organization called NOFA. Um, you guys have uh, VABF down here. There's PASA, you may have heard of. There's mm -hmm. OFA. There's so NOFA is the one in, in the Northeast states. Um, so I've got a background, um, A, sort of on the farm, um, and then B, actually helping to run an organization. Um, and um, after spending my 20s traveling the world, I kind of fell back to that basic pattern, didn't fall very far from the tree. Um, my wife and I have a 24-acre farm a couple towns south of where I grew up. Uh, we bought an old cow farm, an old rundown dairy, the classic white house and red barn. Um, Big old post and beam barn, nice little, nice little place. We got it for a steal because it was falling down. Um, we've you know, pretty well fixed it up at this point. Uh, we do uh, about two acres of mixed vegetables. We've got <coughs> pastured um, poultry. We do grass-fed beef. We're getting the perennials established. Um, I've got about a half an acre of hoop houses, eight, eight hoop houses. I do a lot of uh, salad greens, a lot of season extension. Uh, very low tech, um, no heat, no you know, just just one layer of plastic. Um, I delivered 70 pounds of salad greens yesterday mm -hmm. morning on the way to the airport. Um, and that was my fourth or fifth delivery. Um, um, I mean, we take February off, basically. We don't have enough. It's too cold. We don't get much to pick in, in February. But uh, we go through most of the rest of the year. Uh, we do about 50, 60 grand um, gross in all of our sales. I like to say I work about 20 hours a week. Um, and that's good for me. It just feels like a nice, a nice lifestyle. Um, I get to be home with my kids and uh, be outside in the land and make a decent living and uh, have free time to go do other fun stuff like travel the country and pull my mouth off. So um, our basic agenda for t today, th this course is uh, something that's come out of my experience um, as a farmer. Um, when I got married uh, 11 years ago, um, I was, like my parents, the kind of farmer who couldn't make a living doing it. Um, and um, that was fine when I was single and would just, you know, go traveling in the wintertime, but um, having a, a wife and, you know, children coming, um, <coughs> I had to think about um, my trajectory in life, and I had no viable <laughs> skill sets besides farming, and it was not very viable. So 
I got to thinking about <coughs> things and thinking about <coughs> organic and, you know, I grew up as an organic farmer and was always sort of had my head up, you know, a little bit higher in the air because I was organic and, you know, I knew organic was better because obviously organic is better. Um, and uh, <laughs> got to thinking about the health of my plants and, and things and started sort of questioning that assumption. Um, I like to tell the story of our old farm dog, Stewball. Oops, there goes the first piece of chalk. Um, dog. <laughs> Little pieces of chalk. Um, Stewball, an old um, black lab sort of mutt. Uh, he, you know, he was a puppy at one point, but by the time of this story, he was 12 or 13 years old, and he was laying in the, laying in the driveway, and a CSA member came and um, pulled in with their big SUV and didn't see him, and uh, drove over his rear end, basically ground him into the driveway. And he yelped, and they stopped, and um, um, apologized profusely, and nothing was broken, so he got to go hang out in the house for a few days. You know, his job was to keep the coyotes at bay, um, but he was not working <laughs> after that for a little while. I remember checking him a couple of days later, and um, where the you know skin had been torn, there was maggots, like in eating his flesh, right, like in there. Um, and I was totally, oh my God, there's maggots eating stewball, like, um, and it was a, a big shock, and uh, you know, kind of repulsive, and and um, and I was going out later that day with a five gallon bucket to knock potato bugs off potato plants. And um, I was like, so we have larval forms of insects eating my animal alive, and that's a big shock. And we've got larval forms of insects eating my plants alive, and that's totally normal. Um, I was like, huh. <laughs> um, <laughs> and that was sort of one piece of this larger conversation that I was having with myself about things. And, um, you know, our Flea beetles would eat our brassicas alive in the spring. We don't even, we didn't even plant broccoli or cabbage or cauliflower or char, or, you know, kale. We just don't stop doing it in the spring because we couldn't because the flea beetles would come eat, eat them all. Like we did fall brassicas, but we didn't do spring brassicas. And we would do successions of cucumbers every three weeks because powdery mildew would come and eat the cucumbers. I'm not sure people know all these vegetables and um, diseases and things like that. But um, I got to thinking about organic and if it was better then the plants should be healthier and if they're being eaten alive then maybe they're not healthy um, um, and so that was sort of what you know part of what's got me on the path of doing more reading doing more you know studying going to courses going to conferences um, and um, what I've been doing for the past 10 years or so is uh, um, still actually following you know certified organic practices I'm not doing anything that's not certifiably organic, but really much more focusing on the health of the plant, um, the uh, vitality of the, of the plant, the pest and disease resistance, the flavor, the aroma, the nutrition, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I'm going to be you know, probably jumping a little bit around um, on topics of human health, and um, maybe we'll get into consciousness and politics and uh, economics and carbon sequestration um, and other other topics, um, agribusiness and, and pharmaceutical industry. But really, um, what's interesting to me is that there's this wonderful nexus point where um, growing healthy crops, growing food plants that are healthy actually helps to address a number of systemic issues. Um, and so the focus here of this course is really like logistics of what does it take to grow healthy plants? And then some of the exciting stuff is what are the other implications? So I'm sure we'll, we'll touch on those things as the conversation proceeds. Um, this course started out as a six-day course. We did one day every two months through the, through the entire year. We do half a day inside, half a day outside. Um, um, people don't show up for things every two months all year long. They've got life happening. So we condensed it down basically to two days. And it, really, I like to do this one day in the fall, one day in the spring. Uh, the day one today is sort of fall and, fall and winter. Uh, concepts, principles, um, you know, basic infrastructure and systems, and then tomorrow's going to be spring and summer, uh, planting, transplanting, in-season monitoring and management, visual analysis, uh, um, and things like that. So um, so the handout you have here today is, is really much more of the fall, winter kind of concepts, and then tomorrow is, this, is spring and summer. Um, and that's generally how I'll, I'll, I'll organize the, the conversation. So questions that you've got that have to do with um, in-season stuff, we'll, we'll try to, we'll, we'll probably be addressing more systemically tomorrow. Um, but um, 
we, we will we will jump around. There should be enough time for for lots of questions and conversations. So feel free to engage. Um, I think that's a rudimentary overview of what's going mm -hmm. on. Uh, I like to sort of take a, a you know stretch and pee break around eleven. Um, aim for lunch around twelve thirty. Um, another stretch and pee break around three o'clock or so, and then done by four thirty. Um, people's brains are usually have had enough if their butts haven't um, by four thirty. <laughs> um, so yeah, I would love to open it up to questions. Um, what are you guys curious about? What do you want to learn? What are your struggles? Uh, what intrigues you? What are you skeptical about? Etc. I'll just start start a nice list here. Nutrients to put in the ground. All right. Along those lines, um, when you were in Scottsdale and I heard you speak, uh, you were talking about the rock minerals to add to the earth. And yeah. I did look up shale, and it's obviously different than mm -hmm. the limestone. Those are the yeah. two things we seem to have the most. Uh, at access to. Okay. So I'd like you to address maybe how we can use those the best. Uh, shale and lime? Mm -hmm. Utilizing <coughs> locally available min rock minerals. Local rocks. We've got lots of basalt around here. If you got basalt, that's usually what the best rock mineral. Where did you get that? Don't know. Want to find out? I only just got the Virginia. <laughs> you said you got lots of basalt, or you're wondering if we got basalt? Well, you got lots of it because I just found out about the geology of all the stuff around here. But we just got to source it. We got to find it. And we'll what, talk all about the logistics of and yes. what basalts are good to use. If you need minerals, why you would need minerals, where you would get minerals, all that kind of stuff will probably be the after the break, before lunch section of today. Yeah, on the same topic, I've got a mineral assay from Luxstone, North of Charlottesville, if we Beautiful. can take a look at. I'm not sure it does anything for us, but it's... That's have great. A real, have a real one, a live one. Awesome. Yeah. Great. <clears throat> high tunnel grower. So... Looking for a management of the soil in the high tunnel situations. Okay. Like I said, I've got eight of them. Mm -hmm. So... The phosphate. Really yes. <clears throat> What about it? I'm not quite sure about it. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. I got some because Arden Anderson said you get some. Arden said get, <laughs> Arden said get rock mass face. <laughs> Different kinds. A source of supply for a few specific trace minerals. Sources of traces? Yes. Really? It fringes on, on federal property. Okay. All right, I'll talk, I'll, yeah, a little, little gossip on Azimite. I'm interested in reading a plant. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. I call it plant visual analysis. Exactly. Yes. That's for tomorrow. In the olden days, people didn't have fancy labs. And they knew exactly what was going on because they could look at the plant and they knew what things were. They knew what to see, the thickness of the leaf, color of the leaf, shape of the leaf, hairiness, you know, all that stuff. Totally, totally <laughs> valuable. Yeah, I'm interested in like no-till and adding these. Yes. And adding minerals. No-till and amendments. I live with wire grass, or tolerate wire, wire grass. It's like a like a crab grass. It's a quack grass kind of a rhizome. -y. Rhizomes, right? It, it's if you pull it up, it breaks off, and yep. it just keeps coming. If you throw it on top of the ground, it will reroot itself. It's very. Uh, yeah. Uh, can we just talk about uh, invasive, invasive plants, plants in general? Plants. Yep. Voles. Voles. Compaction. Okay. Anything specific? But just general. We'll talk just about general. Are you doing more animal pasture or more no, vegetables? Animal vegetables. Animal vegetables, okay. Uh, drainage and compaction. <clears throat> These are some good questions. This is great. 
raising bricks levels in lettuce and fusion greens. Okay. Fruit, fruit tree nutrition and its relation to disease. All right. Just disease or pests too? Disease, pests, yeah, the whole, the whole, the whole um, pathogens. The, uh, I'd like to know something about like a, a small area, the economics of a small area, whether it's a half acre, quarter acre, like what you have done, yeah. some other people have done, and what the economy of that little plot might be. Maybe knock it down to a sample and then if you yeah. multiply it out, then you have a, a pretty good idea of the economics. Because, okay, economics of small scale? Yeah. What drives me is the implications of what this will do for the people who consume. Okay. Human health effects? So to find enough way to... Yeah. <clears throat> Beyond health implications. Okay. Human effects of quality. I think it'll drive a lot more people, that will drive a lot more people than the implications on economics as a farmer, if you're looking at humans, because there's more non-humans, I mean, not more non-people that aren't farmers, aren't humans, is that what I was trying to say? No. <laughs> I'm, I'm only somewhat biased. Yes, exactly. I'm interested in the perennial plantings, and if you're using gills. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Um, um, Perennial guilds, yep. Uh, guilds can be applied not just to perennials, but annuals as yeah. well. Great. Oops. So we need to talk. Um, I want to understand more about how the bricks relate, because I've seen plants with high bricks still not be healthy for the animals that consume it. Yeah. And bricks and nutrition? Yeah, like, I understand the guide, so I was thinking that maybe the bricks could be high but still be missing some things or excess something or there's ways to get false high bricks and there's the fuzzy line bricks and the clear line bricks and yes. Yeah. I'll I'll I'm not very old. Everybody's got that? Is high bricks always young people don't know very much. Everybody's got that? <laughs> I've been feeling entirely insufficient for a number of years being up in front of people talking about these kinds of things. So just so we're clear. I'll share with you what I think I understand, and that's uh, that's all I've got to offer. Yeah. Yet, <laughs> just right out in front, we'll just say that. So, everything else is taken with a grain of salt. For those who make the mistake of listening to other people. I guess also just yes. is my <clears throat> bricks always better. We'll talk about it. Yeah. Or is yeah. There like a balance. Everything I know in nature has a balance point, and so. If we're just pushing for high bricks, that might be the wrong. If goal. you think you yeah. need a tool to tell you what good is. It's probably the simplest, least expensive tool that we have available to us these days. It usually just tastes good. That the whole thing was if you think you yeah. need a tool, which some people do. Enough. Some people don't trust their instinct, their intuition, their, their own senses. We've been trained to not use our bodies and all of its attributes to <laughs> experience reality. We've been trained to use tools to right. externalize it. <laughs> right? Western science is really good at doing that. So. A lot of us don't trust ourselves, or we don't. We haven't trained ourselves to be, you know, to use our own, our own, our our tool, our body, to discern reality. Um, so I think it's one of the better tools out there, but it's far from perfect. Um, yeah. Yes. This is a tricky question, but I don't like using animals. Is there mm -hmm. a way to have a successful farm or or garden without? Utilizing animals in the production. I mean, I do. I get. I uh, use animals manure. very, very little. I don't use. Really? I don't use compost. I don't. I mean, I run my animals, my chicken tractors, occasionally on the fields at the end of the year, but mostly they're on the pasture land. So, as far as vegetables are concerned, I consider my earthworms to be my animals. Yeah, so if you're okay with earthworms, 
uh, earthworms, bacteria, and fungi yeah, stuff, have yeah. way more, <laughs> way more volume, more pounds per per acre, and way more manure per acre than you'll ever get off of chickens and cows and things like that. I mean, mm -hmm. So, um, beyond that, I'll just animals. I'll just write. <clears throat> we should talk about animals. I'm, I, I was under the uh, under the expectation that there were going to be a few grazers in this audience. Are there a couple? One, two. Three, four, a minority. Okay. I was not paying attention. What was the question? I was in, I was expecting to have a balance between annual vegetable growers and grazers in this audience, and um, almost everything seems to be coming from the direction of people growing in annuals and some a few perennials, but not a lot of, of pasture. So, Interested in pasture too, though. Yeah, I'll, I'll I'll talk. I'll speak to it. I have less knowledge, but I think a lot of the stuff is overlays fairly fairly well. This is a wonderful list to start with. Um, there will be more questions, I'm, I'm sure, as we proceed. But um, I can dispense with a lot of the broad introduction or rapidly move through it so we have time to get to address a lot of the stuff. Anything else before I go further? I know farmers in this area who have been having trouble with ticks and Lyme disease. Mm -hmm. And they will be able to pick it up. So yeah. Uh, I'll write it down. I've got two ways to deal with it. So when we get to it. A lot of comments. Thank you. Powdery mildew in basil. Powdery mildew in basil. That's a hard one. Yeah, that's a hard one. Um, <coughs> all right. Good enough for a little while. Um, all right, so page one. Here's page one. Um, <clears throat> I'll just start with the slide, first slide. Um, high bionutrient crop production. Um, this term bionutrient, um, I personally do not like labels. I don't like isms. I don't like fads of uh, various sorts. I'm sure people are familiar with this concept of fads and labels and things. Um, and yet I am um, actively uh, creating a new word. Um, so there's hypocrisy there from the beginning for you. Um, um, my background, like I said, was in a, on an organic farm um, and coming up, growing up in the organic sort of community um, and sort of part of my critique of organic and that background that I grew up in, um, and I think to some extent we can critique conventional ag and we can, we can critique permaculture and we can critique you know, um, uh, biodynamics, uh, local, et cetera, et cetera. I think there's a lot of um, assumptions um, that we have about organic, at least I had growing up, organic was better. Um, that local people, local voters are talking about or local is better. Um, the permaculturalists you know, or biodynamic people think that their crops are better. Um, and <clears throat> this better thing is a really, I mean, what is better? What is good? What's bad? Uh, what is quality? What's, what's high quality? What's poor quality? Um, for me, um, just sort of opening this conversation up and saying, okay, I think we all agree that higher quality crops are the objective, whether we're a conventional farmer or whatever, um, but what is quality? And um, I've been actively engaged in this conversation with the people who should know better for long enough that it seems to me that no one knows what quality is. We have some correlations with quality. We can say that things that taste better generally have higher quality than things that, are, that don't taste as good. Things that are uh, crops that are more pest and disease resistant, like not edible to your potato bugs or your flea beetles or your powdered mildew are of a higher quality. Uh, things that have a longer shelf life have higher quality. Um, we can draw some correlations, but when it comes to actually what are the nutrient levels and ratios in a carrot that are you know, superior or inferior, um, there don't seem to be data sets out there that really categorically say this is what a high quality carrot looks like, this is what a low quality carrot looks like. It's a, it's a continuum and there's all kinds of data points. So um, are you looking at it empirically? Are you looking at it from a flavor standpoint? Are you looking at it from, you know, what's the um, your metric, and then how do you assess it? Um, not that we really need to understand all these things logically, but 
um, my understanding is that there's a there's a pretty broad spectrum of quality out there, um, and the implications of it, how you know, what happens to the land where poor quality crops are being grown? What's the effect on the soil, on the you know on the carbon, on the aquifers, on the um, on the waterways? What's the effect of the humans on the humans who eat these poor quality crops as far as nutritional you know status of their children, uh, from epigenetics? Um, it seems like, to me, this question of quality is, is an exciting one. And so we have coined the term bionutrient to refer to those compounds in crops which you know, correlate with flavor and aroma, um, which seem to correlate with health-giving attribute and nutritive value. We can talk about, um, I like to talk about tomatoes that you buy in the store. Um, people have the experience, I'm sure, of eating store-bought tomatoes, whether they bought them or were getting a sub at a, you know, at a, you just call them subs down here? Grinders, what do you call them? Subs? Okay. Hoagies? I know they're hoagies in some places. I think more the Midwest, but anyway, yeah. <laughs> when you get a sub at a sub shop and there's a tomato on it, and you're like, that does not taste like a tomato. Even though it looks like a tomato, it does not taste like a tomato. You know the difference. Well, it, you know, it's within the realm of tomato as far as appearance is concerned. I was talking to Vale on the way up here this morning about my experience in New York City. Um, there's this whole urban farming thing. You've all heard about urban farming. I don't want to offend people who live in cities, but um, being someone from the country, going to the city and talking about these things, and people seem so gung-ho about themselves being farmers, and then you go look at their crops, and they're so sickly. They're just so sickly, and you're like, <laughs> I wouldn't be proud of those plants, but that's a different conversation. Um, <clears throat> We know about the spectrum of variation in flavor and aroma in tomatoes. We know about the spectrum of variation in flavor in you know, peaches or carrots. Right? I mean, I have had the experience as a farmer of selling too many of my carrots, not having enough to get us through the winter in the root cellar. We use up all of our carrots, and then we go to one of our customers, a local health food store, and buy organic carrots, and they taste profoundly different. The kids who were eating carrots every day stop eating carrots because they taste different. They sit in the cooler and rot because no one touches them. Right? There is a massive nutritional disparity in crops, organic, within organic, within conventional, within local. Um, and so what we're trying to talk about here is um, really the quality of the crop. I don't really care so much whether you call yourself local or call yourself organic or call yourself whatever. It doesn't matter to me. What matters to me much more is what are the flavor and aroma profiles which correlate with the nutritional profiles, which correlate with the health giving attributes, et cetera. So um, that's what we're trying to refer to with this term bionutrient, those biologically derived nutrients, not synthesized vitamin D3 that they put in the milk, right? That's fake or, you know, we get a, a thousand international units of vitamin C in your vitamin C pill. My understanding is your body doesn't recognize those synthesized compounds, even though they have the same chemical signature as an, as real natural vitamin C, your body doesn't recognize it as vitamin C, it doesn't treat it like vitamin C, right? It's, it's different somehow. So those nutrients which come from a biological origin, which come from a living um, process, um, we're talking about the level of those in our crops and that really being the objective and the overall um, you know, aim we're, we're moving towards. You don't have your hand up, you're just you're counting, sorry. <laughs> that was a hand halfway up. <laughs> um, so high bionutrient crop production, that's the sort of the broader uh, conceptual framework that this conversation will hopefully, you know, revolve around through the next couple of days. My name is Dan. That's my email. That's my uh, phone number. If you want to contact me afterwards, you should feel free. Um, I generally try. I'm getting better and better about responding to people. Um, historically, I've been very bad, especially when it comes to email, because I don't spend a lot of time in front of a computer. Um, but I do have my phone in my pocket most of the time. So uh, for whatever it's worth, if you feel like you'd like to reach out to me, um, you should, you've, got my, you've got my details. Okay. Um, I'd like to start um, with a basic picture. And uh, those who saw my introductory lecture have seen this picture, so just bear with me. Um, um, I'm going to call this a plant. For those who... Understand that my artistic capacities are limited. I'll just tell you what it is that I'm drawing, so there's no question. That's a plant. Anybody got that stick figure? I can do uh, 
something at the ground level so you can see this is supposed to be not one of the other lines. All right, so um, what I'd like to say is that we understand that most plants have leaves. Most plants have green leaves. Um, what's this? Sorry. So we got green leaves here on this plant. <clears throat> um, why are leaves green? Because they have chlorophyll in them. And what happens in the chlorophyll? They produce sugar, right? Um, bas the basic recipe is uh, water and carbon dioxide and sunlight equals sugar and oxygen. They release the oxygen into the air. That's what we breathe. Everybody knows this. Um, this is all fair, I think. Nothing, no big deal for most people. Um, the factoid that really is intriguing to me and I think is an entree into this larger conversation about how to grow healthy plants um, is that uh, healthy plants, all the plants you see, trees, grass, you know, everything, green leaves, healthy plants take uh, between 50% and two thirds of the sugar they manufacture in the leaf and literally drop it down through the root and inject it into the soil. So all the green leaves on all the plants are there basically to make sugar, which they then take and inject into the soil. Now people would in many cases say, that's stupid. Why would you do that? Why would plants do that? And I think a few people in this audience know the answer to the question why. Um, they do that because in nature, nobody's adding fertilizer. Right? And plants have evolved a way to feed themselves, which is to feed their, um, their critical symbiotic um, you know, community, the bacteria and fungi, which live in the soil, and that's what's called the rhizosphere, um, because they're the ones that actually feed the plant. Um, we know about gut flora. People know about gut flora. They know that there's a bunch of people living inside of you. Um, there's between four times as many, four times and 10 times as many non-human cells in your body as there are human cells. For every one of your cells, there's four non-human cells for every, or 10, depending on who you're reading, how many antibiotics you've had recently. Yes? And the greater diversity of those is the greater your immunities. And the greater your, your systemic function, precisely. The broader, the broader the spectrum of, of variation in that community, the more like an old growth forest it is, the more established and, you know, strong that system is, precisely. Um, so uh, the point I'd like to make is about um, babies when they're born, human babies when they're born, um, we know that there's, you know, when you're about to come out, there's nobody living between your mouth and your rear end, right? There's nobody in there. You're, you're just human. There's, there's no other cells in there. Um, the process of passing through the birth canal um, the process of drinking what comes out of the mother's breast before milk, which is called colostrum, is a process of inoculating your body on the outside and the inside with the critical bacteria and fungi necessary for us to function. Right? We have this idea about germs, um, that germs are bad. Um, it just so happens that for a really long time, we've been living in a beautiful symbiotic relationship with germs. And it's only very, very recently that we thought that germs were bad and we've got this germ theory, a la Pasteur, et cetera. Um, but uh, colostrum is what I like to talk about is, this, is a very sort of simple example. Many people know what colostrum is. Colostrum is literally what comes out of the mother's breast before milk. It's a probiotic, it's a prebiotic. It helps establish the gut flora. Um, calves, they say, who are taken off them, who aren't allowed to get colostrum or put on milk replacer immediately after they're born, will be dead calves. Um, they'll be colicky, they'll bawl. Anybody heard of bawling calf? Mm -hmm. You know, bawling, ever heard of bawling baby? A colicky baby yes. that cries? Right. That is nature's like siren, right? That grates on your nerves, that gets your attention, 
right? Just like a police siren or a, right? That's nature saying something is really wrong, right? Babies shouldn't cry like that. Something's wrong when they do that. That's nature telling us something's wrong. What happens is we can't digest our food. We humans don't have the capacity to digest our food. It's the people that live inside of us that are the ones that digest our food for us. And without them, we're SOL, right? I mean, we're, we, we, don't, we, don't, we don't function. Yes? 4-H project, Western Colorado, collected bum lambs from a big sheep operation. Yep. I got about 25 of these who would not be able to survive in the original environment. I brought them to try to feed them and nurse them, and I had about a 30% mortality. Yep. <clears throat> But I did get some that made me a little bit of money that helped me to go to college. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> uh, my it was a real struggle to get these lambs to be able to eat cow milk, to be able to not have diarrhea, yeah. to go to the man-made formulas, yeah. and it was a rough go. It's not natural. I mean, my understanding talking to, to you know, dairymen and, and graziers is that if your calf doesn't get colostrum, it's basically a dead calf. I mean, it's really hard to, it's really hard to bring them, to pull them through. Um, when our human babies don't get, don't get their colostrum because they get put on, you know, formula right away or they get antibiotics, which kills off the people in their gut flora and they're colicky, we usually don't let them die. We usually, you know, stay on top of enough to keep them from dying, but they struggle. It's a lot harder on them than it should be. Um, so. I mean, the basic idea here is that in the same way that, that we have a critical gut flora symbiosis necessary, necessary for us to digest our food, it's exactly the same for plants. Um, plants uh, are not able to digest the soil to pull in all the nutrients that they need to grow by themselves. They can't do it. It's only the people that live around the plant's root in what's called the rhizosphere that have those functional capacities, that have the ability to, you know, raise and lower pH and solubilize nutrients and digest them from their crystalline form into a protoplasmic form and make them food for the plant. And so the larger point I want to make is that it, I don't really care too much what kind of a plant you're growing. I don't really care too much whether it's alfalfa or you know, pasture, you know, um, orchard grass or apple trees or garlic or, you know, mint or, you know, cucumbers. And to, to, the, to a very large degree, it's much more important what the environmental conditions are down here because the plants are going to help establish, you know, apple's going to have a little bit different gut flora than a cucumber is. Um, but what happens in many cases is that we don't have the environmental conditions down here for the gut flora to exist in the first place. And that's what's messing things up. So I really, you know, focus much of the conversation on creating the environmental conditions for the bottom of the food chain to flourish because only when the bottom of the food chain is flourishing should we expect the top of the food chain to flourish. Um, we had this area off the coast on New England called the uh, Grand Banks. I'm not sure if anybody's ever heard of the Grand Banks. Um, it's where all the fishermen between um, New Jersey and Newfoundland uh, drive their boats to to park to go fishing, right? Newfoundland, New Jersey, you can see it on a map in your head. Big difference, mm -hmm. far apart. All the fishermen from the whole coastline all drive to the same spot to park to go fishing. Why do they do that? It's where the fish, it's where, it's where the fish are. <laughs> and why are the fish all there? Because the food for the fish is there, right? And why is the food for the fish there? Because the environmental conditions are correct. Only when you've got the warmth and the minerals and the sunlight, do you have the, phy the phytoplankton? Only where you have the phytoplankton do you have the next level, the next level, the next level. So in many cases, we talk about feeding our plants and really, um, while you can keep a plant alive by feeding it, um, foundationally, if you wanna be able to stand back and do less and less work, um, it's about creating an environment where the bottom of the food chain is flourishing. From my perspective, this is the sort of the foundational argument. Um, if you're not okay with this, idea, I'll give you a refund. Um, this is basically, this is my dogma. This is the, this is the philosophy of the course. So um, um, that's what we're going to be talking about is how do you create the environmental conditions for life to flourish. And then when you do that, you should be able to stand back and do much less 
uh, work and have more productivity. People know about the um, Native Americans and the manner in which the Americas were being managed by them when white men came from a production standpoint. How many pounds of beef were being raised? How many? How much? How many apples were being produced? How many fish were in the rivers? Was that? They, they were. They they were putting up the, the Native Americans, as I understand it, said the role of the human animal was caretaker of the land, and the caretaker sees you know where they can put a light, you know, effort here and light effort there, and we can modulate. We can start a little fire here. We can, you know. Um, you know, collar these trees over here, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, my understanding is that if we can work well with nature, um, we can do much less work and get much more productivity. Um, um, that's, you know, a bit out of the model of our conventional monocrop tillage, bare soil form of agriculture. Um, but my perspective, I'm trying to grow food and make a living doing it and not work, and not work too hard. And it seems to me that the more machinery I use and the more um, expenses I have and you know the a lot of our assumptions about the way agriculture should be done I think are wrong and if we can learn how nature does it we'll, we'll be we'll be benefited in many cases so um, okay so we got a basic picture here um, so the question from there is what does this life in the soil need to exist what must be present in your soil if you want your plants to grow well Nutrients. Okay, we got nutrients. We'll call those minerals. Soluble. Microbes. Um, call it life. Water. Water. Air. Air. Animals. Animals. Um, let's say animals. Worms. Life is life. Will can sort of the whole the whole food chain. Uh, maybe we'll sort of fit into this rubric of life. Energy. Energy, food, Sorry. yeah, organic matter. Um, I'm going to put carbon here, um, but that's either sugar or or dead plants, um, which you can't get if you don't have sun, right? Sometimes when I give these courses and there's people who live in the suburbs who are trying to have a garden um, and they know where they want to have the garden and the plants don't grow, and you ask them about some of the details and it happens to be they only get two and a half hours of sunlight a day because um, <laughs> their neighbor's trees are on the south side of their garden. Um, of course, you need sunlight and, and warmth also you need. So I'm going to assume people can know that you don't plant things in February or at least not very much in February and you need sunlight. So we'll assume, I'm going to assume those basic things. I think there's a lot of management practices that we can um, discuss that generally seem to empower people. Um, so focusing on these five topic areas is where I like to I like to go with the conversation. Um, um, and in many cases, there's some really simple things you can do to to address those deficiencies. So that's what's written here on the bottom of page slide number two: um, minerals, biology, carbon, water, air. Um, the basic um, principle and objective is to address limiting factors. Um, the assumption is life will do the best that she can with what she has available to her. So our work as farmers is to, or growers of all sizes, is to identify what the limiting factors are that are keeping life from flourishing and address them. And then you can stand back and do much less in general. So goes the philosophy. This is generally my experience. Um, supporting and empowering soil life is the key to healthy plants. I think we basically, you know, discussed that, made that point. What's that? Page one is on the back of page three for most people. I'm on slide number three of page number one. All right, there it is. Okay. Okay. There we go. Getting there. <laughs> um, things that you do or let be done that harm soil life, harm your plants. Um, anybody ever um, been? Um, I like to talk about uh, shiny leaves. You know what shiny leaves look like? on your grass or on your, you know, broccoli or on your summer squash plant. When the leaves are shiny, you know that look. And then you know that they, sometimes the heat of the summer comes and they stop looking shiny. See that shine go away. First question is, what's the shine? It's fat. It's fat. It's called the, it, um, the lipid layer. We talk about the lipid layer, the waxy cuticle on the leaf. Um, we know that as animals 
Um, when we get too much to eat, when we eat more than we need, we stockpile it in the form of fat. People have heard about this at least. We don't have any experience with it. Um, <laughs> Most people don't have any experience with that. Um, plants, when they get too much to eat, stockpile the extra energy in the form of fat. They stockpile it on their leaf, so when their leaves are shiny, that means they're fat and happy. Right? A shiny leaf plant is a fat and happy plant. And when the heat of the summer comes on and that shine goes away, my understanding is that in many cases, simply what happened is it got hot for a week or 10 days in July and didn't rain and soil dried out. And you think there's enough water there for the plants to grow because you know their roots are decently deep and you can reach your hand down there far enough and you can find some moisture. So there must be moisture for them. Um, so it wasn't that the plants didn't have access to water. It was that the people who were living in the area where there's no water were all dead, right? You can reach down, you can dig down, you can find moisture four inches down or six inches down, find the plants still have access to water. But all the people living up here, the 500 billion of them in every tablespoon of soil, when the soil is powdery and there's no water, they're dead. You got chickens, you got cats, you got children. Don't feed them, don't water them for a couple days and see what happens. Right? A couple days. Life cycle of bacterium, not that long. How long does it take for the soil being dry for the life of the soil to be dead? It doesn't take too long. If they're the ones that are feeding the plant, when they stop feeding the plant, the plant hasn't eaten for a few days, it starts to eat up its fat reserves. That shine goes off the leaf because the plant is hungry. So uh, th th I said, things that you do or let be done that harm soil life harm your plants. Letting your soil dry out is one of the best ways to harm your plants because it it harms the soil life. This is rudimentary, it's nothing fancy, nothing complicated, and in many cases we don't maintain hydration. We don't maintain sufficient water in the soil for our plants to keep growing through the growing season. This is embarrassing. It's embarrassing how simple a lot of this stuff is, and unless we understand it, we don't necessarily do anything about it. Not that understanding is, is sufficient in many cases, but I mean, there's a bunch of questions about minerals here and, and all, that, all that stuff, sourcing them and blah, 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 blah. Uh, what I like to say is if you can't maintain hydration, don't waste your money on minerals. It's not my line, actually. It was a guy named Kerry Reams who said it. Who is, anybody we know who Kerry Reams was? A couple people in the back row know Kerry Reams. <laughs> Took his course in 1980. What's that? Took his course in 1980. Right, well, wonderful. Yeah, yeah, well, not long before he passed. Yeah. Um, my understanding, one of the one of the sort of visionaries uh, of our of this century, the past century, as far as agriculture is concerned, and human health too. Um, Reams, one of his aphorisms was, "If you cannot maintain hydration, don't waste your money on minerals. If you do not have the capacity to keep moisture in your soil through the growing season, you are wasting your money by putting minerals down. Right? Water is critical for life. Um, of course, we need copper and and boron and calcium for for biological system function, but if there's no life because there's no water, it doesn't matter. Yes? Can you just say his name one more time? Kerry Reams, R-E-A-M-S. Uh, the Reams Biological Theory of Ionization, RBTI, is a really interesting topic area for those who are interested Best in... Best place to get books is uh, Pike Agri Labs. Pike, PikeAgri.com. Bob Pike in Maine was one of Reams' students, is still alive. PikeAgri.com. Yeah, all kinds of tools. And Reams was able to use a refractometer and a conductivity meter to test people's urine and saliva and tell you whether you had heart disease or colon cancer or um, you're about to get a you know, um, brain aneurysm. And not only could he tell you what was wrong with you, but he could tell you that you need some lemon juice you know, every hour you know, two ounces, you need vinegar. Um, you know, he could, he looked at things from the ener energy of the things. He didn't care so much about like, what's the levels of the low law? He, 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 I think he was a clairvoyant. My understanding is he was clairvoyant. I never met him, but from talking to people who did, um, he, he saw that he looked at the spin of the electron cloud, not the electron cloud, the, the nucleus of the element. And he would say, look, 
These guys are all spinning in a clockwise manner. These guys are all spinning in a counterclockwise manner. It's when the opposite spins come together that the energy is released. And so he would look at the balance of your spin. He called male energy and female energy. This direction of spin is male. This direction of spin is female. And he'd say, you have too much male energy. Therefore, you need to balance out with female energy. And he could get people who were, you know, stage four, go home and die cancer, give them some lemon juice on the hour and, you know, distilled water on the half hour and their cancer would disappear, right? I mean, just ridiculous responses. Thousands and thousands and thousands of people. He wasn't just an agronomist. He wasn't just helping farmers. He was helping humans, too. Uh, really interesting character. Almost no one's heard about him. It's really unfortunate. Um, but anyways, tangent. Uh, many, many tangents. Um, if you cannot maintain hydration, don't waste your money on minerals. Um, what you do that harms, or, or let be done that harms soil life, harms your plants. Um, um, can you guys whispering about here in the front row? Everybody, like, just guys I talk to in the hardest thing to do is to get them to drink water. They just want to yeah. take supplements. I'm like, all you have to like, start with a little simple thing. Water's really actually kind of important. Yeah, yeah. Like, it's like all it's the stuff. The water like, you're drinking, similar. though, it can be yeah. harmful. Yeah. You just don't need to drink. I used to think, yeah, but if you're getting from fresh fruits and vegetables, it's a different kind of water. Town water, water. city, city water is, yeah. <laughs> water is one of our topics for later the day tomorrow. Um, water is a really, really interesting topic. It's not just H2O. Anybody ever irrigated the garden with a hose or with whatever kind of irrigation system in the drought and then it rains? Right, you irrigate and irrigate and irrigate and irrigate and the plants sort of stay alive but don't really do anything and then it rains and poof, they take off, right? Like, it wasn't the water that made them grow, it was something about the water, right? It was the energy in the water. Water is a really, really interesting topic. Really, really interesting. There's a lot of really, really interesting stuff and we have this sort of chemistry analysis of things. We've broken it down to the atomic and then we know what it is because we know what the atomics is, right? I mean. I think there's actually a lot more going on. It seems to be the data is telling us there's more going on. And working with water in living systems is, you know, running water, stream water is different than irrigation water. Um, putting water through a pipe makes water unhappy, right? It loses its energy. You've tasted stagnant water, right? You can taste stagnant water is different than, than, than spring water. It, it feels different in your mouth. Um, so. These kind of subtleties seem to have a big, seem to have a big effect on life. Anyways, um, maybe I'll just talk about a couple of basic things of, of maintaining hydration. Um, so, um, so strategic ways of addressing deficiencies as far as hydration is concerned. How do you manage for maintaining, maintaining water? Um, I, my experience as a farmer growing up, you know, and watching the weather for the past 30 years, plus or minus, um, it seems like there's getting to be more and more extremes in the weather. It seems like we're getting more and more periods of like six weeks with nothing but hot and dry and sunlight, and then three weeks of cloudy and cold and rainy, and then you know February is in the 60s and April's in the you know below 10. Um, I mean I think we got more snow in April than we got in February in Massachusetts this year. Last year we got 10 feet in February, right? I mean. It's just all over the map. So call it climate change, call it global warming, call it law of the averages. I don't want, care what you call it. Um, um, being prepared for extremes in the weather, I think, is just plain old good strategy. And so, so water is really important. What are some ways in which you can maintain hydration in your land? Um, what are some basic strategies? Um, so rudimentary level of, of maintaining hydration is keep your soil covered. Um, where in nature do you see bare soil? Desert. How well is nature doing in the desert? Mm -hmm. Yeah, nature, I like, you know, we talk about mother nature, we've heard about this one. Yeah, she's a woman. I like to say, uh, she's a woman, she's modest. She likes to keep herself covered. Anything that you do which forcibly rips her clothes off, think about that being your mother. <laughs> and you are ripping her clothes off. Like, or someone else's mother. How would someone else feel if you ripped their mother's clothes off? Right, she likes to keep herself covered. Nature keeps herself covered, whether it's through green growing things or, or dead plant material, 
nature does everything she can, it seems to be, to keep herself covered, to keep the soil from being visible. Um, so anything that we do to cause soil to be uncovered, we can say is violating nature to some decent degree, more or less. Um, I like to say on my farm where I do grow annuals in the annual growing area, I want to be able to see my soil less than two weeks of the year. Um, you know, sure, I'm going to be preparing the soil for planting seeds and things like that. There's going to be periods in time when I can see the soil. Let it be as little as possible. Let it be as short a period of time as possible. Um, and, you know, all things in moderation. Um, you know, I've given, I gave a course in Iowa this fall and um, um, there's thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of acres that get tilled up just because in the fall, right? They, don't, they could leave the stubble there. <laughs> they could plant cover crops, but they get the big tractor out and go for it, just do some plowing. I've heard it called recreational tillage. I read about this, like, <laughs> it's fun to drive a big tractor. You feel like a real man driving a big tractor. Nope, oh, gotta go plow the fields. It's time for fall tillage. All right. That's a real good way to wear out the ground. Um, organic matter uh, oxidizes, right? So when, if we talk about the life in the soil being, being present here, whether we want to talk about it or not, they need food to eat. They eat the sugar, like I said, that comes out of the plant leaves. If there's no sugar coming down from the plant leaves because there's no plants growing there, they'll eat the organic matter that's in the soil. And when they get done eating the organic matter, then every, they die off. And so when you till up the soil and you don't have anything growing there, you don't have any mulch there, you don't have any leaves or straw or hay covering the ground, um, that's a great way to eat up and functionally oxidize all your organic matter, turn it into carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Um, my understanding is that at least 40% of the CO2 that's been added to the atmosphere since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution has not come from hydrocarbons, not come from burning oil or coal or gas or wood. It's come from burning soil. The process of tillage, the process of chemical farming um, is a process of oxidizing the soil, turning organic matter from the soil into carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So 40% of the CO2 that's been added to the atmosphere at least, this is a, a minimum, since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution has not come from burning hydrocarbons, it's come from burning off soil. So <coughs> things that we do like tillage um, that keep the soil bare um, or even weeding, regular cultivation, keeping the soil bare, right? I mean, you don't see the ground bare in the middle of the summer anywhere except for people's fields. You don't, that's not how nature does it. Nature does not keep herself bare. In the hot and the dry, the best way to wick the water out of the soil is to have it be bare. Keeping it covered with leaves or with straw or with hay or with cover crop residue, um, that keeps the moisture in the soil much more um, and you have much more reserve. And the more organic matter you've got, the more water your soil can hold, et cetera, et cetera. So keeping your soil covered is a sort of foundational principle for maintaining hydration. Is there a question? Yeah. Tillage, tearing up the soil in Africa now has resulted in about, I think the number is 20 million hectares of desert. Yeah. Deserts are growing rapidly all over the place. Yeah, India, you know, China, yeah. Africa, US, every, everywhere. This drives the starvation in the world. Foundationally, I mean, and not just the tillage, but the chemical farming too. The, I mean, the Green Revolution, I worked in villages in India um, and I saw literally people starving to death and moving to the cities to sell their bodies because they simply cannot eke a living off the land anymore which they were able to do for thousands of years, thousands and thousands of years until the Green Revolution came. The Green Revolution, the chemical far fertilizer burned off the little bit of organic matter that they, they were able to maintain. Now it's gone, now the soil's dead, now they're starving to death, now they're going to the cities, and we've got you know 30 th million people living in whatever, Bombay, right? I mean, the slums, the whole thing. If you've been to Africa, you've been, we have these megalopolises where we have millions, tens of millions of people living in abject poverty because the soil is worn out. It's, I mean, from my perspective, the way we solve a lot of these deeper, deeper cultural problems is by building soil. And there's no reason we can't turn that desert back into green. There's absolutely no reason we can't do that in many cases. I've got a friend who's working in China. This, you know, it's, we can't talk about it because it's not been published yet. But I mean, doing amazing things, turning the desert green. Millions of acres at a time. 
right? Systemically doing this, changing the weather patterns so we go from two to three inches of rain per year to 12 or 13 inches of rain per year, absolutely changing, changing the weather patterns, changing the climate through managing the soil intelligently. It's, it's totally doable, it's really exciting. Um, but anyways, so, uh, yes? Can you clarify the use of mulches of you know, dead material, organic matter versus a living mulch? And what sort, you know, how much does a living mulch protect the soil in, in terms of moisture conservation? And what, and how much you're losing in transpiration out of that living mulch? So there's this idea that weeds, you know, compete with your crops for water and things like that. Um, um, my experience, last summer was another one of our, I think four out of the last five summers, we've had about six weeks from the middle of July to the end of August with no clouds, you know, humidity levels like 15, 20% in the 80s, just totally dead. There's no clouds, right? I mean, this, this, something was wrong. There should be clouds. There should be thunderstorms. There's not. It's really not right. Um, and um, the areas where I had bare soil, it was powder. It was absolute powder. The areas where there were weeds growing that I hadn't tilled up to plant something, there was much more structure. There was much more moisture in the soil. Um, um, I personally um, think if the, if the plants that are growing there are not shading out my crops, they're not weeds. That, that's polyculture. That's how nature does things. Where do you see monocultures in nature? In the cornfield? Forest. Forest. <laughs> Forest? Where? Monoculture? monoculture? Nature does not do monocultures. The loblolly pines is not nature. Right? Kudzu is an invasive, um, but you will not see kudzu in a, in a um, old growth forest. You'll see kudzu in a worn out pasture where everything's in, in rough shape. Um, what's that? At the margin of woods, at the edge of the woods. That's right. right, which is, which is not nat natural. If you let nature just be for a while, you're not gonna find monocultures as I understand it. Repeat what you just said. If it's not competing for sunlight, then it's not, not a, a weed. weed. Then it's not a weed. You were the one who asked about the guilds, weren't you? Yeah, because yeah. I was just wondering about that because yes. I was posted on the site. I was trying to get some guidance about all the native, you know, like the dead nettle and the ground ivy and, Precisely. All, the, and all the violets. And I'm yep. like, should I be pulling this up? No. Can I leave it? <laughs> so the idea here is that um, nature <laughs> might have figured a few things out. Right. Right? Nature has been around for a little while and might have figured a few things out. And just because we have tools to measure things doesn't mean we necessarily know better. Um, so, I mean, my, my thought here basically is that, that watching what works and trying to emulate it, biomimicry, you've heard the term perhaps, biomimicry, we, we, look at, we look at life, we look at nature and we see how does nature work and we try to work in harmony with nature instead of trying to apply what we think is better. And, and the idea here is that you don't see bare soil in nature, you don't see monocultures in nature, right? I mean, this, it's not how nature does it. Nature does polyculture. Nature does multiple species of plants growing together. Um, and so, um, you know, understories of white clover growing underneath your kale plants, I think, is wonderful, yeah. as an example, yeah. right? Uh, there's no reason why you have to have bare soil under your tomatoes. Um, there's no reason why plants growing around your crops are bad, except maybe if they're shading them and keeping them from getting sunlight. Um, if you come to my farm, it will look all weedy and, you know, unkempt. And you see me not in the field, but out swimming with my kids. And then you see how much money I made this week. You see how often I spend out in the field, and you're like, wait a minute. So it looks all weedy and messy, but he's making good money and he's not working very hard. <clears throat> like, okay, nature might look weedy and messy, right? It's not like it's got straight lines and everything's clean and organized, but, but everything's flourishing because that's how nature does things. There's multiple layers of canopy and um, all that kind of thing. So okay. did that answer your question somewhat? Yeah, yeah, pretty well. Pretty well? Yeah. If there's pieces I haven't touched on yet, can't tell me. No. No? Well, good enough for now. <laughs> you, you incorporate a lot of Masanaba, Fukunova's stuff into your... Fukuoka was or one of our brilliant elders as far as I'm concerned. Uh, people who have not heard of the One Star Revolution, 
Um, this was sort of a big <clears throat> seminal text. I think it was printed, published in the mid 80s first in English. Uh, Fukuoka, the author, was a, a, a Japanese uh, farmer. Um, and uh, he, you know, <clears throat> mastered the art of doing as little as possible um, farming and making good money growing healthy plants. He had his perennials growing with his annuals underneath him. He would, you know, he would come through every now and then with a little, you know, a, a scythe or a sickle and cut down some weeds and throw some seeds down and come back a few, you know, like he would like, like I like to do, he liked to amble about his property. Um, anybody like to go for a walk on their land? Like, I would really just let me, I, if I could choose what to do, I'd just go for a walk on my land. And while you're going out for a walk, you notice things and you see things and you just pick things and, right, that's basically what he was doing, which I think is not too much far off from what the Native Americans are doing. Um, they were, you know, ambling through the land and touching it here and touching it there and um, doing little bits, but not a hell of a lot. And so, um, you know, the adverb is the best fertilizer for the land is the footsteps of the farmer. The farmer's footprints are the, the best fertilizer. The farmer's shadow is the best fertilizer. Yeah. Exactly. Which is, I mean, we have to talk about consciousness and intention and, you know, your presence actually is part of reality and your thoughts and... Can I go off that deep end yet or should I wait a little while? <laughs> 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 I'm not sure where the audience is on this topic, but, um, you know, uh, what is... Yeah, what is nutrition, uh, what is food for? Is it just the elements in the cucumber or is there something else about the cucumber that makes it different, that makes you feel more energized when you eat it, right? Um, people have heard of Rudolf Steiner, I'm guessing, uh, with biodynamics. There's a <coughs> one of Steiner's students, a guy named um, um, Pfeiffer, Aaron Reed Pfeiffer, um, asked Steiner at one point, um, why is it that when we sit down to meditate, you know, call it pray if you want to be Christian or call it meditate if you want to be not, you know, I don't really care. Why is it that when we sit down to meditate, to pray, and we can feel that communion with the divine, we get to that state where we are experiencing something real, visceral, we, we experience it, we don't have words for it really. Why can't we maintain that when we get up to go about our day? Anybody had this experience? Anybody had the experience of sitting down and like really connecting and feeling something? And then you get up to go out your day and you want to stay in that state mm -hmm. and it's gone? My experience has been that it just gone. Like, I'm there, I'm there. Oh, no, I'm not. No, that's <laughs> gone. And Pfeiffer asked Steiner, why is it that we can't maintain that state of consciousness? And Steiner said, because your food does not have enough soul force. Because your food doesn't have enough soul force. And I don't know what he meant by soul force. He said it was, he, of course, he was speaking German, which was then translated. And so I haven't done the, like, the, the tracking down to see what the other versions of that word are. But I was just talking to somebody recently who was, um, uh, her teacher was, a, was an Indian um, sort of Swami guy. And um, he had a similar comment, which was that the, the, that the plants are basically this, this vessel um, that are that are you know producing food, but it's the intention of the farmer. Um, if you are when you're walking out and you know in your fields, if you're feeling this intention of this being nutrition, this being food for your cows or for your customers or for your family, the act of sort of praying that into your plants um, is the soul force. Is how you get that nutrition, that value into your plants. I don't know. I don't know any, I just, well, that sounds pretty interesting to me. And, you know, why not pray while you're walking, right? Mm -hmm. That's not gonna mm -hmm. hurt too bad, mm -hmm. I don't think. <laughs> um, it might even be good for you. Um, you know, why are we growing food in the first place? It's to feed people, isn't it? So let's do it with as much good intention as possible. Um, anyway, it's all really interesting. I don't know. I haven't found anybody who has all the answers, but um, it's all really interesting. Yeah. My personal experience is when I go into the garden, analytically, left brain, yeah. I do not achieve any state of exaltation. Yes. If I go out with benevolence and love, I have this spiritual experience. Exactly. Absolutely. Absolutely. 
Yeah. And by the way, I teach praying. <laughs> <laughs> you can call it if you want to call it. There's different cultures that have different words, and you know we've got this whole thing about like I'm organic, you're permaculture, I'm Christian, you're you know Hindu. I don't know. I <laughs> I think we have. It's nice to have structures to work within, but then at some point you don't need the structure anymore. Hopefully, um, I was talking about water and ways to maintain hydration in the soil. I think before we got off on the <laughs> esoteric, um, water is a good vehicle for vibration, um, and that's these are topics I usually wait till the end of the course to get into because I don't want to come off as too much off the deep end when I get started. But I guess here we are, so um, <laughs> we'll deal with it. We're going to roll with it. <laughs> yeah. You think a living mulch actually harvests more water? That was, the, that was the rest of what soil? I was going to say. Thank you. That's what, 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 what I was going to say. Go out there in the morning at 5 a.m. and you see the dew on the leaves and then you see it actually runs down the leaves into the, you know, there's like a little wet spot underneath every plant, right? The, they're actually pulling water out of the atmosphere at night and the more hairs they've got in the leaves, the more moisture they're collecting and the more water they're pulling down. You, it's, it's bare dry. On, 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 on bare soil, there's no wet spots. On soil where weeds are growing or plants are growing, cover crops, regular crops, you'll see that moist spot at the base of the plant um, in the morning in the middle of a drought when you won't see it on bare soil. Absolutely categorically. Right. Yes. It's kind of like the redwoods taking mist from the oceans and they're probably pumping it into the soil absolutely. to feed the bio absolutely. into the soil because they're on the top of a rock and they don't have and any we think water. that you know these weeds are stealing water from our plants um, if that was yeah could you put white clover in the asparagus bed absolutely put white white clover in, a, in an asparagus bed white clover is asparagus white, white clover was one of Fukuoka's favorite plants mm -hmm. Fukuoka loved white clover absolutely loved white clover White clover doesn't get very tall, right? It doesn't get very tall, so it's not going to compete with most of your most of your crops. It's a perennial, mm -hmm. and it's a it's a legume. It's a nitrogen fixer. White clover is that the same as Ladinia clover? I'm not sure. Ladinia is no. a white type of white. I know it's white. But, but it's, it's taller white. It's That's a where it's tall. the shortest, right? White clover. I mean, what I've white Dutch, Dutch white Dutch, Dutch white clover is the short clover. one. Is that what you want? To step Dutch white clover. That's what you'll find in lawns sometimes. It sort of shows up. <clears throat> There's all it's kinds short. of clover. It's short, because I kind of, it's plant, very short. I kind of that in my lawn, it really saved my grass. Yep, absolutely. I'm going to plant it in my spirits when I open. Yep. <clears throat> you, you can, can have it in your pathways. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah.
Yeah. Should I do that after I cut the hay or any time? Um, and that was my point about earthworms, was the earthworms will bring the minerals down into the soil, so you don't need to, don't need to till, till the ground to get them into the ground. Um, so I cut my hay high. I usually leave yeah. my hay about three inches high. Good. That way it's got something to keep growing and won't die. Very good. So do yeah. I put the middle down then, or do I put it down any time while it's growing? Anytime you put it down, we'll start to get the minerals going in the system. The generally, when we're talking about putting minerals down, we're talking about, at least what I'm talking about, is more rocks than fertilizer. I'm not talking about things that have a number on the bag. I'm talking about things that have, you know, some basic element in them. And the problem with rocks is they're not soluble. So you're not going to get a response from rocks in the next cutting, necessarily. Right. I'm so, trying to get it down and get it in the earth. So as far as I'm concerned, if you're going to be putting minerals into the ground because you identify deficiencies, they're not going to be doing any good until you put them down. Right. So I don't see any reason to wait and then wait and then wait. I mean, ideally, I teach this course in the fall. We'll talk all about this after, after the break. Is mineral balancing and, and how to do it and when to do things. But in general, um, putting things through a compost pile is a really good way to put. So if you do compost, if you've got you know, a bedded pack or a cow manure, or we can talk about all that stuff. I'll talk about that after the break because okay. it's a really it's a whole it's a whole conversation by itself. Um, I wanted to finish the water topic, but you guys are asking too many questions. This is great. Um, mm -hmm. um, the water topic you were talking about. I've seen exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. During the summer, when you're watering these plants, you just make them survive. Yeah. As soon as it rains, they, they grow. Flourish. What is in the water to make them do that? <laughs> That's the question. Well, it's not in the water. What's the vibration of the water? This is again a topic that I've got on my agenda for tomorrow at the end of the day, okay. but no, what is water? What is, people know about this whole water? I mean, water is a whole, a whole ball of wax all by itself. I don't think we really know. I mean, there's people that have thoughts and I can give you some names of people who've written books and we can start to understand better. There's some tools you can use to make your irrigation water act like rainwater, but what is, is One this when you small topic. Water yes. Like putting it through? So you got your blood, right? Everybody knows about blood. It's a fairly viscous fluid. Um, if you are taking blood and you are pumping it through a series of little tubes, you start off with a little quarter inch tube, and you go down to a sixteenth of an inch, and you go down to the size of capillaries. You know how big capillaries are? Capillaries are really, really, really small, right? So you're pumping blood through a series of s smaller and smaller tubes. Blood's not like water, blood's more viscous. And then it's gotta come out of the, out of the capillaries and then it back, goes back into the veins. Think about your, your circulatory system. How many PSI would it take to pump blood through a series of pipes that size? Literally, 80, 120, Literally, the amount of PSI, pressure, pounds per square inch of pressure required to pump blood through a series of tubes that size would blow, would blow us up. But your blood pressure is too. Your blood pressure is way below 80 PSI. It's way below 120 <laughs> PSI. <laughs> so what, what is it in PSI? PSI? What's that? What is it in PSI? I don't know what it is in PSI, but the, but the heart is not pumping your blood. The heart is... Anybody ever watched water run downhill, down, yeah. a, down a, a metal roof, it goes like this, right? It goes like this. It never flows straight. It always goes back and forth. Yeah? You look at the, a river, a stream on the, on, the on, the, on the land, you look at a map, the rivers always go like this. That's in 2D. That's, in, that's on, a, on one flat plane. It looks like this. But in 3D, it looks like this, right? Water likes to move in a spiral, they say. Water likes to move in a vortex, in a spiral form, and that's apparently what the heart does. It's not pumping your blood, it's putting spin into your blood. So it's literally vortexing, that's, that's the only way it flows, because that's how water likes to flow. I don't know, this is what I've heard. It's really interesting, it's all really, really interesting, but it is on the agenda for tomorrow, so I'm gonna let it be there. But with that one little um, point. Um, You've heard about the um, tidal force? Mm -hmm. Something about the moon and gravity. Water goes up instead of down. Surfer. What? Surfer. You're a surfer, okay. Um, at the edge of the ocean, 
You can see the water goes up and down twice a day. They say it has to do with the moon. I'm going to trust them. My understanding is the tidal force is operational not just in the ocean, but on land too. My understanding is that the water moves up and down in the soil through capillary reaction based on the moon's you know, gravity twice a day. So if you don't have a plow pan, if you don't have a hard pan, and you've got anything resembling a decent water table, your plants will be watered twice a day from underground. If you've got a plow pan, if you've got a hard pan, if you've got that area, can we use the penetrometer? Can we bring it inside? It's right here, right in front of me. I thought, yeah. You guys know what a penetrometer is? Something you stick on the ground to see how much pressure. It's got a little PSI gauge here. And you stick it down, you can see, okay, down four inches down, we got a pressure of 300 PSI. All right, water is not going to flow through that with capillary reaction because the moon's gravity isn't strong enough. So if you've got a plow pan, if you have tilled your ground when it was wet or somebody did 50 years ago or drove over it with too many tractors or don't have enough calcium and the soil's compacted, then what's happening in July is your soil's drying out, not necessarily because there's not water in the subsoil, but because it's not able to move up through. So then, you know, strategies for um, breaking through the plow pan are critically important. There's some really simple tools and techniques, oftentimes, you know, ones that are used for um, people on acreage, on forage, are these things called a, um, a yeoman's plow. Anybody heard of a yeoman's plow or a uh, key line plow? There's these plows that are, it's not a plow exactly, it's just a shank with a little foot on it that goes down 18 inches and it just sort of cracks open. It, it, you know, it goes down below the plow pan and cracks it open and you get one running every eight foot and a half or every two feet. And you go through and you crack that open and maybe you drop some seeds down in the crack with the, if you got a, if you got a cedar, a planter box behind the, behind the, the uh, plow is called. Um, so there's some technical ways you can, you know, mechanically crack open the plow pan to facilitate hydration. Um, um, you can use things like forage radishes, which is a, it's a, they're called a daikon. Have you heard of these forage radishes? They're like your arm, right? Literally, it's this big, massive, it's a Japanese, you know, gourmet vegetable. Um, but it will drill down there and, you know, it'll crack open the soil and then it dies in the winter and rots and turns into this goop that is food for soil life. And they eat it and they, you know, go through and crack things open. So there's all kinds of different ways you can deal with compaction. but. If you've got compaction in your subsoil, that's going to be a real pain in the butt when it comes to maintaining hydration in the middle of the summer. Water's really important. Water's really important, and if you don't have the environmental conditions to maintain water, um, you're in trouble. So that's one of the one of the big things I like to talk about. A um, couple of the pieces of the water puzzle. Um, uh, what was I going to say? Uh, one is is um, is the key line system. You've heard of key line and um, Alan, Alan Yeomans, um, I think, is the sort of initial proponent. Y O E M A N S, I believe. Key line. And Alan Yeomans is from Australia, <clears throat> and he figured out how to get water to move uphill in the middle of the desert in Australia. Pretty sophisticated. Really low tech. Uh, permaculturalists talk about. Um, the water and lay the lay of the land and the water and basically you want to capture the water at the high points. Um, um, so there's a, I mean there's a bunch of good information out there about making ponds and and then getting the water to flow, you know, across the across the land to maintain hydration. Um, it does rain. It just doesn't rain all the time. So you want to be able to capture the water when it does rain and have it sort of percolate through the landscape um, instead of running off. Uh, or just dropping down through the through the subsoil. So and there's there's a number of systemic strategic ways of addressing these things. I don't have time here to go into them. And these other farms are doing a better job, you know, demonstrating this kind of stuff. Um, on my annual on my annual cropland, um, I absolutely put down drip tape. Um, um, I you know which is an irrigation system. There's overhead irrigation systems you can use. There's in ground irrigation systems. I use drip tape, which is an in ground irrigation system. Um, it was developed by the Israelis in the Negev Desert um, as like the most efficient way to use water um, 
you know, they have very, very little water in Israel in the Negev Desert, and they still grow lots of vegetables. So on my fields where I'm growing crops, um, I have what looks like these raised beds. I just have a bed former, um, which goes behind my tractor. So we're going to call this a four foot wide raised bed with like a one foot pathway. The pathway is just a divot in the ground, right? The bed former just, it basically is a disc. It's a shank and a disc that pushes the dirt up. And so I've got a bed. Um, and so when we- Permanent raised beds, or do, you, or do they move from year to year? They don't move. Um, I may or may not re-up them on an annual basis depending on how much they've fallen in. Um, we're planting seeds right now and you know, the pathways are still there, so I'm not dealing. It's a it's an optional thing. You when you get when they start to be really gone, then I put put them back up. But it's just basically one track, one pass with a tractor. Uh, right now the tractor's not running, so um, the pathways are, are just fine. <laughs> 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 My tractor doesn't run very often, um, but luckily I don't need it that much. Um, but in a fair, in a four foot raised bed. I will run, and I don't have colored chalk, I don't think. Um, I'm not gonna use a pen. Um, <laughs> I will use, I'll put three lines of drip tape in a four foot bed. Um, people who grow vegetables, uh, in many cases I see going into farms, um, um, a sort of the classic case is sort of the, uh, the black plastic raised bed with the tractor path in the middle. Have you ever seen farms run like that? Mm -hmm. I run 40 acres of vegetables. Well. Take out all the tractor paths. <laughs> You've only really got 12 acres of vegetables, but that's okay. Um, right? You know the tractor path mm -hmm. that they come through, they till to keep the weeds down? So you got your black plastic raised bed, and underneath that black plastic is one line of drip tape coming out up, up the middle. Right? You put your tomatoes in, way too close. And then you got literally 10 feet, 12 feet, 14 feet until the next bed. Next line of drip tape. Middle of the summer, hasn't rained for a while, you've been tilling this middle part to keep the weeds down. You, you rip a hole in the black plastic and it's powder under there. Mm -hmm. It's powder. As soil. It's powder under there. And people wonder why they get late blight. Yeah. They wonder why they got late blight. If you cannot maintain hydration across the entire root zone, for me, the field is a field, like a physics field. We want energy flow, we want nutrient availability, we want, you know, I want my, my plant roots to be reaching out yeah. and talking to each other, right? I put my, my tomatoes on five foot on center and they get big quick. I, I want to give them enough space. I want their roots to be able, as above, so below. People heard about this one? As above, so below? Yeah. yeah. How much plant is there above ground? How much plant is there below ground? If you've only got water in this little skinny zone right here, you're not gonna have big plant reaching out all over the place because there's no water for it, right? So for me, maintaining hydration across the entire soil profile is, is, is a foundational critical step um, in sort of good management of the soil. Um, just a quick thing about the bed shaper. Yeah. If, you're not, if you're trying to reduce your tillage, for, yeah. for me, it's sometimes hard to get a good bed formed if the soil has not been tilled extensively. Yeah. Mm -hmm. what, do you, what do you do for your challenges on that? Or do you have that challenge? What do you mean good bed formed? For planting? Um, so with our bed shaper, to, in, in order to for it to grab enough soil to mm -hmm. raise it up more than like an inch or two, yeah. Um, I have to have pretty loose soil. So do you have a what, what? What's the logistics of your bed former? I mean, what's what is it? Um, Mine is a shank with a disc behind each. So time. I got two discs, uh, one behind each wheel. Behind that, I got two forming boards, and then I have a a board that levels. Yeah. So, so mine works. is. I think it runs a Buckeye, but it's right. got a little shank in front of the disc. Okay. And that shank basically loosens up the soil that then the disc can put, can push up. So after the winter, um, if you have, if you have stubble and, and or weeds in your bed, mm -hmm. do you go straight through that um, with your bed shaper or do oh, you? It depends entirely. Um, so. Um, my best planting of greens right now, I do a lot of salad greens 
the other question back there was how do you make lots of money and not very much land? And one of the ways you do it is you grow high value crops. So I'm growing a lot of salad greens right now in my in my hoop houses. And I'm, I mean, I think we made 700 bucks off of 2,000 square feet on yesterday, on Thursday. Um, and that was just one picking. That was this week's picking. Um, so, um, I can call it 3,000 square feet if you want. Um, it was probably 2,000 square feet. Um, um, so my best planting of salad greens this year is in a hoop house that was tomatoes last summer. And my tomato hoop house, we got a bed like this, we got the plants yay far apart, I mean, literally five feet on center, right? Literally five feet on center. Those, those tomato plants were kicking butt all through the fall. We got our first killing frost in the middle of October. Um, those tomato plants all died and they sat there on, with their mulch until this spring. I pulled the mulch back, broadcast my seeds, raked them in, and they're up and running. <clears throat> um, so I've got a lot of areas on my farm where I had chard, where I had kale, where I had potatoes, where I had summer squash, where I had a nice thick mulch layer and like we planted salad greens outside yesterday in the area that was potatoes last year and we didn't do anything besides pull the mulch back. It was the occasional weed that had established last fall we pulled out, um, but there was no tillage necessary, no bed forming necessary because we had the soil covered. There was not a, not a strong weed population. In the areas where like say we had beets and carrots last year where there is a decent weed population, I would probably go through there with a uh, rototiller and do a shallow till. Um, I am not philosophically opposed to tillage. I understand tillage is destructive, but I, I do do it when I feel like it's necessary and appropriate. I try to minimize it, but I just try to go as shallowly as possible. That is a, that answer your question? Uh, yeah, to an extent. But Keep asking it in different okay, forms so until you get an answer. Um, when you re up your bed, what do you do? Yeah. Like if you have a bed that's sat and it's just kind of settled in, yeah. and over the course of a year or two it's kind of lost its form. Yes, exactly. What are you doing? What's your first step? What's to get to the point where you're depends on what's there. If there's mulch there, I got to get it out of the way because the mulch will screw up the bed former. Right. I mean, it'll just right. might as well more. not do it. So I might have to rake it out of the way, or I've got a pinwheel rake. I can run behind the tractor. <coughs> you know, pinwheel rakes, old ground driven pinwheel rake. You can just walk. You can just pull that right through, and that'll pull all the pull all the mulch right off. Um, um, keeping the soil covered with mulch keeps it so loose. And the weed pressure stays remarkably low. The life stays high. The earthworm populations are high. The need to till the soil because it's not tight is almost gone. In many cases, farmers till the soil in the spring because it's tight because they was, there was no, nothing feeding the soil through the winter. And the soil life ate up all the organic matter and then died and the soil sort of collapsed. Right? And so that was your mistake for not leaving enough food for the soil life in the fall. Which is why I like to start this course in the fall because People think of the fall as the end of the growing season, and I say the growing season is a cycle. Mm -hmm. And so the end of one growing season is the beginning of the next growing season. And if you don't have in place in the fall all the things you need for the spring, you're shooting yourself in the foot and you're not going to have a good growing season. Yeah. You can prepare yourself for next year. So putting the minerals down, you know, until they're digested and bioavailable, they're not going to do any good. You can put them down in the spring, but they're not really going to do much good because they aren't available for the plants, really. Um, so keeping the soil covered in the fall, whether it's through a cover crop or through mulch or some combination of them is, I think, really, really helpful when it comes to establishing, you know, to putting things into the next year. So um, if I've got a bed that's fallen, that's fallen in, uh, fallen down, and it's got good mulch on it, I'll pull the mulch off and then re-up the bed. And then, depending on what I'm doing, you know, transplant into it or seed into it. But I don't need to do much um, to do that. Uh, the, having the shank in front of the bed former, in front of the, in front of the disc really helps. Um, um, I don't com I don't compost. Um, you just leave it. I just leave it at the edge of the bed, and I pull it back and mulch with it later, if I need to. Yeah. Um, I find compost to be more work. Anybody know about composting? I just mean like static compost. Like you yeah. Put in a pile somewhere, you just leave it next to the bed. And uh, I believe you move it as move it as little as possible. Yeah. <laughs> well, I didn't know because you were saying you seeded salad greens, but I was thinking if you spread all that tomato waste back over top of salad greens, it seems like two big stems. It depends on how far we're broken down. It was pretty well broken down. Yeah. It's now that now that's at the end of the hoop houses. I've got salad greens in there now. 
I'll put tomatoes back in there in a month and a half, and then I'll put that pull that mulch back in. And yeah. that, I got my mulch ready for yeah. for next year, for this year, or to the edge of the new houses. Yeah. After our discussion, I came to this preliminary meeting. Yes. I started thinking about water in my high tunnels. Yeah. I use drip tape. Yeah. I have three row, I have four foot beds, three rows of drip tape. Yeah. And I started looking at the amount of dry area that was being left on that bed with mm -hmm. drip tape. Yeah. So I went out and bought tall sprinklers. Yeah. They stand up about this tall. Yeah. Drive in the ground. And they do. And I started watering. I four tunnels. So I did one tunnel with the overhead sprinklers and yeah. one with the drip tape. And in the one with the overhead sprinklers, I'm getting water all the way across the bed. Yeah. And the produce is twice the size of where it is with the drip tape. This is in three weeks. In three weeks. Nothing else. That stuff I brought in today is from the one. Does that and stuff look gorgeous? Ever see that stuff yeah, you brought yeah. in? It's Can ridiculous. That's the stuff <laughs> in the overhead. That's probably like what John Jeevens and his intensive stuff's always recommended overhead watering because the water gets some sort of energies in it and picks up out nitrogen and things out of the air Maybe. as yeah, well. Yeah, all the books the say don't use it in a high tunnel. Don't use overhead. You'll get mildew, you'll get all this stuff. Yeah, yeah. but if you have enough mineral like and nutrition and your mildews probably are People not are issue. afraid of disease yeah. and we'll talk about pests and disease and you know that's for sissies. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, mean, I think so. I think it's, it's I think it's just washing everything. I'm gonna try it on the tomatoes. My husband's gonna kill me. Try it out. If it's true, it'll work, right? If it's not true, it won't work. What I, one, one, I'll just say this right now, and I'll hopefully repeat it a couple of times. Don't take my word for anything on everything I'm saying. If you're, if it sounds intriguing, experiment in a corner and see what happens. Just experiment, and if it seems to work, try it somewhere else, and, and then tell your friends. If it's true, it'll work, and if it works, it'll spread. That's the basic thing. If it's not true, it won't work. And if it doesn't work, it won't spread. But my thing with drip tape is people don't have it on enough. When you put the drip tape on, people talk about, oh, I'm going to have it on for two hours a week. I do it for half an hour a day. Do you have long drip tape? You're weak. Blah, blah, blah. I'll turn the drip tape on. And sometimes the drip tape, I mean, the thing is the water goes down and out, right? And so it will may still be look like it's dry on the... On the on the surface, but you got to stick your fingers down there and you got to feel how moist the soil is. And people, my experiences, have a, a mental thing about how long the water should be on for. And they turn it on and then they turn it off. But if they stick their fingers in there, they don't, the soil isn't even wet. So that's my question is when you have you, is your soil wet with the drip tape throughout? Not wet enough. So maybe you've had the sprinklers on, you've actually put more water through the sprinklers than you have through the drip tape from one house versus the other house. The drip tape goes, I don't know whether it's the condition of my soil in the tunnel or yeah. whatever, because it's a very loose, very mm -hmm. so repel water. And it goes it, straight down. Yeah. It doesn't spread. Yeah. Interesting. It should spread with very drip tape. Little. If you look at like the drip tape, uh, some of the manufacturers have this diagram or this image, and they show like in sandy soils, you're looking at more of a teardrop. Yeah. In clay soils, you're more looking like an egg turned on its side. It's yeah. definitely has mm -hmm. a wider spread in clay yeah. soil and sand that just drops straight. Yeah. Mine's real lonely because I've been hauled it in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's just going straight down. Mm -hmm. And it's not going mm -hmm. and, and some of the roots aren't established yet to be deep. But if you, yeah. if, you it, to get if you if you keep it if you keep it moist, I mean the thing about the, the, the tidal force is if the water's down there, oh, it will come up. back up. It, but in many cases people just don't put enough water in. People have been afraid of water. I, mean, I go out to California, people are like, oh, we don't need a water. We don't, we, we don't want our tomatoes. That makes them sweeter. We don't water grapes. That makes them sweeter. I'm like, uh. it's like saying cut the leaves off, and that makes them better. Anybody heard this one? Yeah. Get rid of the leaves. I'm like, the leaves are the ones making the sugar, which is feeding the soil life, which is feeding the plant. So pruning your leaves off is not going to make sweeter anyways. Yeah. Well, it's 11, 10 after 11. I was going to make a break. The yes. The triad thing is, <clears throat> the triad thing. Of trying things. <laughs> to figure this one out. Um, is that you're, it's such a dynamic continuum. Your farm is a living organism. And so even if you try something one time and then you, it works and you do it again, the conditions are different than when you did it before. Even if it's the same thing, the same bed, the same time of year, the next year, it's different. And so it's, there's always like a balance where nature's going to be health. And if you keep steering right, 
you do something in the theory system right, and you think, oh, that worked really well, I'm gonna do that again, I'm gonna do that again, I'm gonna do that again, I got it, right? And then you go off the road. So it's gotta be adaptive, and so if you do it and it works, and you do it more and it doesn't work, maybe there's a level in there that, or a timing thing, or yeah. a sequence of what you did before, how it's relating to the other elements that is really important. Yeah. Fair enough. Um, so we've made it through three slides almost. <laughs> um, uh, what's that? Is that normal? I can I can uh, expand or contract the amount of time we spend talking about any topic. So I think we've talked about a number of good things, even though it appears that we haven't done that much. Um, if you give me about two more minutes, we'll finish page one, and we'll be on schedule, and we'll take a break at 11:15. How's that sound? Um, and we can stretch and pee. And I'm not sure if there's coffee back there or there's water at least. Um, but. <clears throat> Things that you do or let me down that harm soil life, harm your plants. Um, that was the basic basic point. I was wrapping on water. We can talk about tillage. There's all kinds of things we do that harm soil life, that harm our plants. And the question is, you know, do you understand the implications of what you're doing? Um, um, quality is the objective. Nutrient level, flavor, aroma, shelf life, pest and disease resistance, I would, I would say, yield. Um, I referred to that already, um, but that's the basic gist behind the agenda here is that um, I don't really care what you call your process or what your label says. What matters to me is what it tastes like, um, what it smells like, and how you feel after you eat it. That's the that's the that's the broader the broader broader comment. Uh, one point I didn't make about this I don't think today. Um, uh, my understanding is that um, of all of our DNA, which is apparently a lot, right? We got this big DNA thing chain. Um, Thirty percent of it. 30% of your DNA um, uh, facilitates the function of your nose and your tongue. Your nose and your tongue are a third of your system function according to your DNA. We got all kinds of system functions, right? All kinds of things that go on in our bodies. All kinds of, I mean, there's a whole bunch. <laughs> and a, according to the with, scientists, with the feedback from the nose and tongue regulates more of it of it is for nose and tongue because it's so important that we s taste and smell gut. and discern what to eat and what not to eat based on how things taste and how they smell because that tells us what's good for us and what's not. And when your body is telling you that your organic local carrots don't taste good, listen to your body. Yeah. That's your animal instinct. We say we've lost our instinct, it's not true. We just don't listen to it, right? When something doesn't taste good, and we have all of our, you know, all the food scientists that are developing all these compounds to add to our crops to trick our noses and our tongues, right? They know about the, the salt and the fat and the sugar. The Dorito effect, Mark Schatzker, he was our keynote speaker at our conference this year. Um, um, very interesting. Very, very interesting. So um, the flavor aspect, the aroma aspect, um, until we've got good hard science, if we ever can get it, of what quality is, um, we already have a really, really sophisticated nutrient monitoring system. It's called our noses and our tongues, mm -hmm. right? It's way more sophisticated than any gizmo is ever going to be because it's actually present in real time with where our body's at. Because everybody's bodies are different, you can't ever say, this is a good carrot for everybody. We can say, this one's All good right. for, pe for this person, this one's yeah. good for this person. Um, but, um, you know, sometimes you want sweet, sometimes you want bitter, sometimes you want sour, sometimes you want... Um, astringent. There's all these different flavors that have different nutrients which address different imbalances and different people's taste buds are tuned to different things when they need different things. And that's how we get our bodies balanced. This all makes sense? I'm going fast but not covering, not something too far off the deep end. All right. So correlations of health. The idea here broad, more broadly is that there's a direct correlation between soil health and plant health, between plant health and human health, and I would suggest between human health and cultural and environmental health. I would suggest that because we are all so frickin' sick, right, we are all so degenerate at this point. Degenerative diseases, yeah. that makes us degenerate, yeah. right? Yeah. All the diseases that are managed, not cured, are degenerative diseases. We have epidemic levels of degenerative diseases. We have children with degenerative diseases. We are degenerate, we are degenerating because we have a couple generations now of people eating food which does not have sufficient nutrition in it, and we are physiologically breaking down. And that, I would suggest, is correlating very nicely with our intelligence, 
our connection to our deeper aspects, our, our cultural milieu, our ability to hold coherent thoughts, our ability to think more deeply and broadly about what's good and what's right, our political dynamic, right? I would suggest that all these things correlate really deeply and profoundly with the food we eat, which correlates with the way we're doing our farming, um, which is why I've come to the position that being a farmer is one of the most radical political, economic, spiritual things I can do. Why, you know, my 20s activism has turned into being a farmer is because I think it actually is being a real activist. Thank you. We can solve problems through this process of growing healthy food, we build soil, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I didn't talk about carbon sequestration. I'll, I'll, I'll fit it in at some other point. Um, so, topics for today, the last slide on page one. Soil testing and mineral balancing, this is what we'll be doing right after the, right after the break. Uh, cover cropping and mulch, biological inoculation. We talked a little bit about that, potting soil. If you do start seedlings inside, you know, what, what they have to eat when they're babies is really important. Tillage, fertigation, irrigation we touched on, foliar spraying. These are the basic topics for the day. Um, it'll all get morphed into the whole two days, but that's the, that's the basic agenda. So uh, it looks like it's almost 11.20 right now. Let's uh, call it uh, 10 minutes to 11.30 and reconvene. <clears throat> all right, great time. <clears throat> Resounding applause. Yes, please, come on. It's a great time. Yes. That's it. The rest of the day. <laughs> Not going to get any more applause. Get it out of your system now. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I need to I'm wired. Can you do that? Can you help plug me?